Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah, I'm so grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for really choosing me to be here this evening and gifting me the opportunity to get a great reward. On my way here on the plane, I was thinking, wow, what a blessing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose me to come and spend a Saturday night remembering him. And I thought of a hadith, and it's one of my favorite narrations. It's a really long narration that both Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahimahumullah ta'ala, collected in their sahihs. I'm going to paraphrase it, and I'm going to condense it because of time. Where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by the way, easy good deeds, and also just out of, out of respect to our Prophet. When I say Prophet, you say, every single one of us should say it. There are so many virtues to sending salawats upon the Prophet Sallallahu If you knew, you would never stop. But I'll share one because we were talking about easy good deeds. Every time you say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala erases 10 of your sins. So let's say we say it 100 times this evening. Any math people, what's 100 times 10? Did anybody commit a, a thousand sins today? I hope not, right? Imagine a thousand sins from your book of deeds being erased. But it doesn't end there. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes for you 10 good deeds. So that is a thousand good deeds. And on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates your rank 10 degrees from every salat upon the Prophet Muhammad so when anyone says the name of the Prophet ﷺ or mentions of the Prophet ﷺ, what do you do? And I want you to say it out loud so that if the person next to you has forgotten, when they hear you say it, they'll remember, they'll say it, and you'll get double the reward, inshaAllah. So really long narration, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a group of angels this group of angels has a specific purpose, a mission. They roam the earth looking for gatherings of dhikr. Now, Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, who you may know, he's the famous author of the famous work, the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi, right? He commented in his book, which is one of my favorite books ever, Al-Azkar min Kalam Sayyid al-Abrar, he said, all of these beautiful virtues where there are so many, and I wish I could have a whole class for you all on the virtues of this, because then you'd probably feel what I'm feeling right now, the, grit, the gratitude and the happiness. He said that all of these narrations that mention the virtues apply to circles, not only of a dhikr, like reciting Quran and saying, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, but also gatherings in which beneficial knowledge is being taught. And so inshallah, the angels are looking for a gathering like this one. So these angels roam the earth, they keep searching. Then they see the light, like Mufti Abdul Wahab said. And so they come rushing. When one of them finds this gathering, and I want you to imagine, remember, Ramadan is the month of Quran, right? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start the Quran? With Surah Al-Fatiha, but then what's next? Surah al Bakara, good job, you guys are awake. He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alif Lam Mim, Thalika al-kitabu la rayba fihi hudan lil-muttaqeen, alladheena yu'minuna bil-ghayb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is a book, there's no doubt about it. It is a guide for who? For those who have taqwa, which we're going to talk about later. Now, what are the characteristics of these believers that the Qur'an is a guide for, the muttaqeen? The first characteristic is what? We have a lot of Arab here, so you know what I just said. What was it? الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ But what does that mean? Those who believe in the unseen. So what does it mean? When I say that the Prophet ﷺ said that there are angels who are roaming the earth looking for gatherings like this, and when one of them finds a gathering like this, it runs to the heaven and it says, Oh, angels of Ohio, I found what you're looking for. It's at Cleveland State University and they all rush and they sit between us and they're so happy. They're so excited to be a part of a gathering like this. 
that they open their wings and they cover us with their wings. Now, inshallah, we're all muttaqin. So what do we believe? That right now there are angels with us. They're covering us with their wings. All right, let's fast forward this hadith. So they come, they sit with us. When we get up and we leave, we're going to all go home. I'll go to my hotel. Where do you think the angels will go? They will go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is best informed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks and says, Oh my angels, where did you come from? And these angels will say, Ya Allah, we came from Cleveland State University. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask, What were you doing there? And they will say, Miftah and the MSA had this event where 500 people came and they were learning about how to prepare for Ramadan and they were remembering you and they were sending salawat upon your Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And then the Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says something very interesting. Allah says, "Why? Why did they come? Why did they go to that gathering?" And I have a question for you. Why are you here? Did you ask yourself that question while you were getting ready and driving over here? If not, now's your chance. What brought you here? What do you want? Why are you here? I'm going to give you a moment to think about that. Because if you didn't put an intention, now's your chance. And if you think about all of our intentions and you think about all of the things that we want, they really can be summed up into three main categories. And this is what the angels tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, they came and they spent five hours learning about you and your deen because number one, they want your forgiveness. And isn't that what we all want? The forgiveness of Allah. Yes. Okay, let's try that again. Isn't that what we all want? The forgiveness of Allah. Yes. Wonderful. I need to know y'all are alive. <laughs> and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, is there anything else that they want? And they say, Ya Allah, they want protection from the hellfire. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, is there anything else they want? And they say, Ya Allah, they want your Jannah. Now listen to the response that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels and told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that you and I can hear it. Allah says to the angels, you angels are my witness. I'm going to give them what they asked for. Aren't you happy you're here? I'm happy I'm here. Thank you guys. You guys got the memo. So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will forgive their sins and I will protect them from the hellfire and I will grant them Jannah. Allahu Akbar. Now there's one angel I call the snitch. If you're a little sister like me, you know what that word means. Growing up, whenever my brothers did anything naughty, they would look at me and say, Dunya, snitches get? The girls know. <laughs> Especially the Palestinian girls. So there's an angel that I like to call the snitch. That angel goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and goes, Ya Allah, but Dunya wasn't there for the dhikr. Dunya had no intentions. Dunya sat in the back the entire time with her headphones on and nobody can see and she was watching TikTok videos. She did not say subhanAllah once. She did not send salawat upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Dunya asked them to all stand, nobody could see her so she stayed sitting. Listen to what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says to the snitch. I love that gathering so much. That gathering is so beautiful so blessed that I give her that reward too. This is a gathering that nobody who even passes through it will leave miserable. So are you guys grateful you're here? Yes. Can we all say Alhamdulillah? Alhamdulillah. Because I think about it, I was sitting there thinking, I could have been anywhere. I could have been in the mall. I could have been in the movie theater. 
I could have been in a restaurant eating with my friends. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted me the tawfiq and created this perfect storm so that I can have the inspiration in my heart to come here. Allowed my plane to not be delayed. Allowed me to get here. Allowed me to sit here. And he did that for each and every one of you. You could have been anywhere, but you're here, alhamdulillah. So I'm so happy that I'm here with you all, and I'm so happy that each and one of you are here. Alhamdulillah, shukrulillah. So Ramadan. Ramadan is a month of forgiveness, just like the hadith asked the angels said. Ramadan is a month of the freedom from the hellfire, just like the angels will tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we leave. And Ramadan is a month in which we can get our signed tickets into Jannah. And so I wanted to share a little bit of advice with you all. And honestly, this advice is from myself first and foremost. I was reflecting when I was asked what I wanted to speak about and I thought I'd speak about something that I needed. A reminder that I needed because I love for you all what I love for myself. And I love for myself the forgiveness of Allah and Jannah. And I love that for you all. So we're going to talk about preparing our hearts for Ramadan. Now, why did I choose heart? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it looks like you forgot. So I'm going to try that one more time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that verily in the body, there's a lump of flesh. If that lump of flesh is good, the entire body is good. And that is the heart. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said, he said that, Verily, Allah Ta'ala does not look at your outward appearances. Rather, He looks at your heart and your actions, your deeds. And so how can we prepare our hearts for Ramadan? Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, as we mentioned, said in the Qur'an that this month of Ramadan is tied very heavily to the concept of taqwa, consciousness of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, mindfulness of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, being intentional and aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointed at his chest three times and said taqwa is right here in the heart. And so when it comes to the discussion of Ramadan, we cannot have a discussion about Ramadan without talking about taqwa. And we cannot talk about taqwa without talking about awareness and mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we cannot talk about mindfulness and awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without talking about intentions. When it comes to our beautiful deen, intentions are so very important. As Mufti mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't necessarily care too much about the outcomes. What he cares about is your intention and your efforts. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful and so generous that he rewards us for our intentions. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that whoever intends to do a good deed, but they're unable to do it, they get the reward as if they did it. Allahu Akbar. And whoever intends to do a good deed and they're able to do it and follow through with it, they get double the reward. And so intentions, my friends, are so very powerful. Be intentional. SubhanAllah, it's so beautiful when I read about the companions that they would say, we anticipate reward in our sleep the same way we anticipate reward of standing up at night in prayer. Because when we sleep, we intend that, Ya Allah, I'm sleeping to rest my body so that I can wake up and worship you. They also said that about food. They were hopeful in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward them for eating because their intention was, Ya Allah, I'm eating to get energy so that I can pray, so that I can work, so that I can do the things that I need to do, so that I could study for your sake. 
So let's, inshallah, become masters at intentions. One of the great scholars of the past used to say, learn the art of making intentions because it can be greater than actions. Something small and a small act with a great intention can make that small act great. And a great outwardly looking act with a small intention can make that act small. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said about Ramadan, Man Sama, and in another narration, Man Qama, Ramadan, Iman and Wahti Saban. The person who fasts Ramadan or stands at night and prays in the Ramadan with Iman and Ihtisab, intentionally, with faith in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and seeking the reward of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will have all of their previous sins forgiven. And so, my dear friends, let's start by making good intentions from now. By making a plan, I want to have all of these goals in Ramadan and make them grand and try your best and know that even if you're unable to do them all, you got the reward, inshallah ta'ala. And so, I wanted to ask you all before we move forward, have you taken a moment or two or five or 30 to ask yourself, what do you hope to get out of Ramadan? How do you plan to make this Ramadan different than every Ramadan that has passed? If you haven't done so, perhaps you can write these two questions down and spend some time tomorrow and reflect. If you haven't already done so, made yourself a plan, a game plan, on a strategy on what and how you want to achieve this Ramadan, then maybe tomorrow you can set in your calendar a half an hour where you grab a piece of paper and a pen and you think, what do I want to achieve this Ramadan and how am I going to do it? Create a checklist. One of the most helpful things that helped me last year was not doing my checklist on my phone or my iPad, but doing it on a piece of paper. And I had the resolve. I really did. I was kind of extra. But I was really afraid. I was like, last year we didn't get to go to Tarawih. We didn't have a Ramadan in the masjid. Like, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity. And so I had my checklist written down on a piece of paper. And I would not leave the masjid in it until I did everything that was on my checklist. It was just my thing. And that was so helpful. Because when it used to be on my phone, even though shaitan's chained up, so maybe it's my mini enough shaitan, I would be like, oh, why don't you just check Instagram for a second? Or why don't you just text this person? Or why don't you just check your emails? Or why don't you do this? And then 20 minutes would go by. Like Mufti said, you say one video, and then what happens? Friends we know. We say we're going to just watch a few videos on TikTok, and what happens? A few turns into a hundred. <laughs> Three hours later, and you're like, oh my gosh, where did the time go? And so maybe you can write it down on a piece of paper and have that checklist with you and have a resolve that every night before you go to sleep, you have all of these things that you're going to do and you're not going to go to sleep until you do them. And so one of the best ways to prepare ourselves for Ramadan is like we said, to prepare our hearts. So I wanted to share with you all five ways to prepare your hearts or we can prepare our hearts for this special guest the guest of Ramadan. The first, usually when I give uh, lectures, if it's your first time, I'll usually do three, five, or seven, and I'll usually give them titles. If you'd like, write those titles down, because later tomorrow, next week, if you just look at those titles, you will remember almost everything that I say. I promise you, there's science behind this. And I'll ask you at the end, inshallah, so be prepared to tell me the five back to me. All right, the first is forgive and seek forgiveness. What is it? So let's start off with the seeking forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every moment is a moment where you can restart and refresh your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as long as you are able to take a breath. 
as long as the angel of death is not in front of you. And as long as the major signs of the Day of Judgment haven't happened. Turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just seeking His forgiveness is literally a restart button for you and I. It's such a gift that no matter what we've done, no matter what has passed, all I need is a sincere sorry and it's as if it never happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh my son of Adam, as long as you call upon me and you have hope in me and you seek my forgiveness, I'll forgive you and I won't mind at all. Even if our sins, I want you to imagine this analogy. Imagine if every time you sinned, a ball magically popped up and appeared. So if you did something kind of small, a golf ball appeared. If you did something a little bigger, maybe a volleyball. And then if you did something really big, maybe one of those yoga balls. Are you guys imagining? Thanks, brothers who are nodding. I appreciate you. You guys are going to get some special da'as, inshallah. So imagine if, I want you to really imagine this. Imagine if, I'm going to use myself as an example. I was a person who sinned so much that there are all these balls, different sizes, they cover the entire earth. And then they cover the entire earth again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, until those balls reach the heavens. Allah said, if your sins were to reach the heavens and you come to me in repentance, seeking my forgiveness, I will forgive you and I won't mind. It's just us. All we have to do is just take that first step and ask Allah for forgiveness. And so, seeking forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really important, especially before Ramadan starts. Cleanse your hearts. The Prophet sallallahu said that every time we commit a sin, a black dot is placed on our hearts. And all those little black dots make our hearts so hard. And may Allah protect us. There are some people that they never turn back in repentance to Allah, so they never ask Allah for forgiveness. So when you ask Allah for forgiveness, every time you say, Astaghfirullah, Allah, I'm sorry, one of those black dots are removed. But there are people, may Allah protect us, they never ask Allah for forgiveness. So those black dots keep accumulating, keep accumulating, keep accumulating until their hearts become ran. Their hearts become so hard. And we don't want to be them. So yes, the Prophet ﷺ said, every child of Adam will commit sins. We're all sinners. But then he completed his statement and he said, but the best of them are the ones who realize it and they repent. They ask Allah for forgiveness. So friends, tonight and every night, before you go to bed, just say, oh Allah, I'm sorry, I'm weak. Forgive me, please. I want to be better. Help me. Ask Allah for forgiveness and know that He will meet you with a forgiveness far faster than you could ever imagine because He loves to forgive and He loves those who turn to Him and ask Him for forgiveness. Imagine. A lot of Palestinians here, so you guys will get my analogies. Whenever I would do something that would annoy my dad, he would go to my mom and say, Bintik. You guys know, your daughter did this, okay? He would disassociate himself from me. Can you guys relate? Holly, everyone's like, yes, perfect. I'm not the only one. All right, so, and that's kind of natural. It's natural that when you're upset with someone, to disassociate yourself from them just a little bit. But listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Tell my servants who have transgressed against themselves. Because when we sin, we're not doing anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're only harming ourselves. Those who have transgressed and they passed every line and they did everything possible, those people who have transgressed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them, tell my servants. He still calls you and I mine. 
he still shows you that love and that affection. So friends, seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second part is forgive. Many of us are carrying these heavy grudges in our hearts, this malice, this hatred that's consuming us and we have no idea. That's so heavy, it's about to break our back. Forgiving people who hurt us is the most liberating thing you can do. Holding on to grudges is renting mental and real estate in your heart and giving that person so much power over you and only hurting yourself. And I'm gonna give you a few motivations to help you let go of that grudge, inshallah, this evening. The first of which is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that on Mondays and Thursdays, our deeds are presented to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala forgives everyone except for two categories of people. The first category is one that inshallah none of us are from and they are those who, who worship other than Allah. But the second category is scary. It's a person whose heart is consumed with malice, with grudges towards others. I read a quote once and I thought it was very powerful. By the way, this topic is so great. I actually teach a whole entire weekend workshop on the topic of forgiveness and forgiving others. I recently taught a two hour mini workshop online on forgiveness and how to help yourself let go of grudges. If you're interested, you can inshallah check it out. But this quote was so powerful because it said, holding on to a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Isn't that true? Do you think that person cares that you have sleepless nights? Now you might be thinking, but you don't understand dunya. This person did such horrible things to me. And I'm sorry. I really am. I'm sorry. He said that the reward is so great that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you can't even comprehend it. So I'm not going to even try. It's with me. I got you. Forgive for yourself, not for the other person. Oh my goodness, there's so much I want to say. Time is fleeting. But inshallah, just remember, every time you hear a narration about forgiveness, remember the person who's actually telling you to forget is not someone who didn't go through hardships. It's someone who went through the most extreme hardships and was able to forgive. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet وسلم, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him a human being just like you. He eats just like you, sleeps just like you. And that that human being وسلم, is our role model. Because he's a human, we can't say, oh, we can't do it, he was an angel. No, <laughs> he was a human. And that can inspire us, inshallah, to let go of those grudges that are taking up so much space in our hearts. And remember, if your heart is filled with those grudges, that means it doesn't have space for the blessings and the love and the mercy and the beautiful things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to fill your heart with. So, number two. Beautify your heart through remembrance. So we said when we seek forgiveness, what happens? We clean our hearts. Now, after cleaning those hearts, what do we want to do? We want to beautify it. How? Through the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran to remember him much and often. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his remembrance in so many places in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Quran dhikr, remembrance. The Qur'an is the greatest form of remembrance and we all know that Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. And so inshallah, each and every one of us starting from today can make it an intention and a resolve to recite Qur'an every day. And in Ramadan, to recite a khatma of the Qur'an inshallah. Say inshallah. If you haven't done it before, inshallah, you will be able to do it. And if last year you did a khatma, inshallah, this year you will do two. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you tawfiq. Talking about hearts, talking about dhikr, talking about Qur'an, I wanted to share with you one of my favorite du'as. And it is a du'a 
of sadness. The Prophet wasallam said that there is no servant who has ever met with sadness or grief or worry and says this dua, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace that sadness with happiness. And the dua is, Allahumma inni abduk, ibn abduk, ibn amatik, nasiyati biyadik, ma dhun fiya hukmuk, adlun fiya qadauk, as'aluk Allahumma bi kull ismin huwa lak, sammayta bihi nafsak, aw anzaltahu fi kitabak, aw allamtahu ahadan min khalqik, aw istathartah bihi fi ilm al-ghaybi andak, an taj'ala al-Qur'an al-Azima rabi'a qalbi. وَنُورَ صَدْرِي وَجَلَاءَ حُزْنِي وَذَهَابَ هَمِّي اللهم أمين. I wish I had time to go over this dua, but I don't because I want to share three more points. So what I will tell you all is, inshallah tonight on my Instagram, I will post it, the Arabic with the English and the explanation, inshallah ta'ala. And inshallah, each and every one of us can memorize this dua. Because the Sahaba asked the Prophet sallam, should we memorize this dua? And he said, yes, memorize it. And every time you feel sadness, say this dua. But why am I saying this dua here when we're talking about the heart and talking about Qur'an? Because the dua is saying, Ya Allah, make the Qur'an the spring of my heart, the banisher of my sorrow. Friends, the Qur'an is healing, not just spiritually, but physically and emotionally. I had a teacher once, who said that dunya, every time you recite the Qur'an, make an intention that it heals you physically, spiritually, and emotionally. This is Ramadan, when you make your khatmah, every time you open the Book of Allah, make a short dua, say, Ya Allah, allow this recitation that I'm gonna do right now to heal me, to heal me from my trauma, to heal me from my pain, to heal me from my heartache, to heal me from the spiritual diseases that I have, to heal me from the physical ones that I have as well. And insha'Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you that healing. Fill your hearts with the love of the Qur'an. Recite the Qur'an all the time. Recite it while you're driving. Listen to it. If you don't have wudu and you feel like you're a little lazy, then remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through dhikr like subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. One of the things I love most about dhikr like this is there are no prerequisites. So you don't need to have wudu. You don't need to be wearing your hijab. You could do it anytime, anywhere, except for the bathroom. But seriously, you could do it while you're walking. You could do it by, while you're in class writing notes. You could do it while you're cooking. You could do it while you're cleaning. You could do it while you're driving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقَعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ تَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Those who remember Allah standing and sitting and reclining, they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all situations. And it's so easy. Just subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu akbar. And every time you make a dhikr, Ibrahim alayhi salam, our father, he said to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, tell your ummah I said salams, wa alaykum salam Ibrahim, and tell them that Jannah is fertile. It has so much space and so much fertile land. And its seeds are the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. And every time they make a dhikr, a tree is planted for them in Jannah. Imagine, I read some of the scholars say, if you own something someplace, what does that mean? No one? That you're gonna be able to go there. If you have property, if you own a hundred trees in Jannah, what does that mean? Then inshallah you'll be able to go there. You'll be able to be there, right? And so keep your tongue moist with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it's hard to remember Allah and know that the reward is so great. If you saw a little white card on your chair when you were sitting, there's a dua that I want you all to keep with you. Put it in your wallet. I keep it next to my credit card so that I don't forget. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he gave us a great reward for remembering him when it's difficult to do so, which is when you are shopping. 
And the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever goes to the marketplace and says, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd, yuhi wa yumeet wa huwa hayyina yamut bi yadihi al-khayr wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, they will get one million good deeds. And they will have one million sins forgiven. And they will be raised in rank one million degrees. And in one narration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build for them a castle in Jannah. Dua of the marketplace, friends, keep this in your wallet next to your credit card because it's really hard to remember it. I promise. I know when I'm shopping and I see the purses, before I get into the mall, I'm like, Dua is suk, Dua is suk, Dua is suk. And then I see purses and I'm like, I forget. And then I'm so grateful that when I open my wallet, I see it and I go, oh yeah, da'asuk. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look at how great the reward is. Number three, when we talk about the heart, we cannot talk about the heart without talking about love. So prove your love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your salah. No one can claim as mufti, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him, said that beautiful poem of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. You cannot claim you love anyone, especially Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you're not doing what that person or what your Lord asks of you. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks from us is so small. But one of the main things that Allah ta'ala asks from us is to pray our five daily prayers. So where is your heart during the prayer? Prepare your heart for Ramadan by learning the fiqh of prayer. And I'm going to repeat that. Please learn the fiqh of prayer. It breaks my heart every time I'm praying. And I notice one of my dear beloved sisters making a mistake in their prayer that can nullify their prayer. It breaks my heart. Because you're making the effort. You're, you're making your wudu. You're standing in prayer. You're trying and then you're not doing it right. Alhamdulillah, we're all adults. We learn so many things. MashaAllah, PhDs and master degrees. How are we going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not knowing the, the fara'il and the arkan of salah? So please, friends, refresh, relearn the fiqh of prayer and learn what you're reciting in the prayer. And inshaAllah, you will be able to cultivate this beautiful love between yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because salah comes from the word sila and sila is connection. You will be able to meaningfully connect with Allah ta'ala insha'Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted us this beautiful gift of salah to give us this opportunity to connect with him five times a day. So inshallah, I pray we are all able to refresh our fiqh of salah and learn the meaning of all of the askar and the ayat that we read in our salah. Number four, prepare your heart to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Mufti mentioned, and this is why it's hard to go after two people, because it's like everything I wanted to say, they're like saying it. I'm going to say it anyways, because there's, there's a benefit and reminder inshallah. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired in my heart as well. In the only place in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in Ramadan, smack in the middle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something so powerful. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ And when my servants ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, concerning me, by the way, in the Quran, in multiple places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, and when they ask you about X, or why? Say. Allah tells the Prophet, you say this, right? When they ask you about the soul, say it is from my Lord. Everyone understand that point? Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when my servant asks you concerning me, I am near. I respond to the one who calls upon me when they call upon me. That's how close Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Ramadan is the month of dua. If you don't have a dua journal, friends, please make a dua journal. Have a book that you write all your duas down. 
categorize them. Du'as from my dunya, du'as from my akhirah, du'as from my parents, du'as from my siblings, du'as from my aunts and my uncles and my teachers, du'as from my friends. And write them all out and sit and talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are three opportunities that none of us, inshallah, should miss every single day in Ramadan. The first is the last third of the night, and this is every night where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the last third of the night, Allah ta'ala jalla fi ula, in a manner that befits him subhanahu wa ta'ala, descends to the lowest heavens, and he calls out and he says, is there anyone calling upon me so that I may answer them? Is there anyone who asks my forgiveness so that I may forgive them? Is there anyone who wants something so that I may give it to them? And this happens every night. Friends, just 15, 20 minutes before Fajr, you're waking up anyways. Prepare your suhoor before you sleep. So instead of spending 20 minutes, you spend five and the other 15, you're spending it calling upon Allah Ta'ala. The second time that shouldn't be missed is the salah time between Adhan and Iqamah. The Prophet ﷺ said that our dua is not rejected between Adhan and Iqamah. And after the salah, after the fard prayers, and the third time, is before breaking your fast. And this is the hardest. This is the hardest, but you have to have disciplines. And you have to tell yourself, I'm gonna make everything ready so that the 10 minutes right before iftar time, I'm not busy doing other things. I'm sitting down making dua until I hear the adhan. Because the Prophet wasallam said that a fasting person is dua is accepted before they break their fast. SubhanAllah. So dua, make time, schedule time every day to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remind yourself of this reality. It's so beautiful. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that Allah is hayi kareem. Allah is shy and generous. That when one of his servants raise their hand like this and say, Ya Rabb, to leave them empty-handed. The Sahaba were like, what? Really? Like Allah answers every time? Then we should make a lot of dua, right? And the Prophet smiled. And he's like, and Allah is greater than that. Allah will keep giving you. And last but not least, number five. You guys are still awake, alhamdulillah. Shield your heart from sin. Shield your heart from sin. Protect yourself from sins, friends. Do everything that you can. During COVID, we did everything that we can to not catch that disease, right? What's more important than our bodies is our heart. Because we said it's the thing that Allah looks at. Allah says, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهِ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ That's what Allah is looking at. Shouldn't we do everything in our power to protect this beautiful gift that He gave us from disobeying Him? And know that the heart has doorways, gates, and the gates to the heart are the eyes and the ears and the mouth. Everything we see, everything we hear, everything we say has an effect on our heart. So we have to be mindful and careful of what we allow in our hearts. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of a person to give up their food and drink, but not give up backbiting and false speech. Once some women because they were companions of the Prophet They came to the Prophet and the Prophet said to throw up. He told them, make yourself throw up. They're like, why are Rasulullah we're fasting? And he's like, not anymore. They made themselves throw up and they found pieces of meat in their vomit. And the Prophet ﷺ said that you ate the flesh of your sister by backbiting her, talking about her behind her back. A few weeks ago, I was in New Jersey with Ustad Majid. I don't know if he's here, but I saw him on the program. And he shared a very powerful hadith. It's the hadith of the Muflis, where the Prophet ﷺ said 
do you all know who the bankrupt one is? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, the bankrupt person is the person who has wealth but loses it all. And he said, no. The bankrupt is the one who comes on the Day of Judgment with mountains of good deeds. They did a lot of good deeds. But they hurt this person, they stole from this person, they backbited this person, they slandered this person, and all those people that they hurt will come to them and take their good deeds. And if their good deeds are not enough, those people will throw their sins at them. Now this hadith is both comforting and terrifying. Do you feel that? Every time I think of this hadith, I have it's conflicting feelings. Comfort, because oh, all the people who hurt me, they're not going to get away with it. But then terrifying, why? I'm human, I hurt people too. And so friends, shield your heart from sins. Protect your heart from doing things that disappoint the one that you love. The one who loves you, the one who created you, the one who gave you all the beautiful blessings that you enjoy, and the one who created Jannah for you. Mufti, am I done? I have more I wanted to share. Should I end here? Or should I keep going? So five minutes? Okay. Now you might be thinking, Sister Dunya, you shared five things, wonderful, but like how can I stay motivated? How can I keep reminding myself and keep working towards this? And so we talked about taqwa. And the most frequent reference in the Quran to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in relation to taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says multiple times in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the muttaqeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says multiple times in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared Jannah for the muttaqeen. So, I wanted to remind yourselves and mind, how can we have this resolve to cultivate taqwa? to fill our hearts with taqwa, it's to remind yourself very often about this beautiful ayah in Surah Al-Zumar. وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرَا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا قَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ تِبْتُمْ فَادْخُلُهَا خَالِدِينَ And those who had taqwa, who are mindful of their Lord, will be led to paradise in successive groups. When they arrive at its gates, it will, they will be open, and the gatekeepers will say, peace be upon you, you have done well, so come in and stay forever. Remind yourself of that amazing day when you'll be standing in front of these beautiful, grand, majestic gates with your Prophet Muhammad وسلم, because your Prophet, even though he endured 63 years of hardships, and he should have gotten out of his grave and went straight to Jannah, he doesn't want to enjoy Jannah without you. Because instead of going to Jannah, he goes to Allah and he says, Ya Allah, Ummati, Ummati. And he goes and he tries to get every single last one of us, takes us to the gates of Jannah. Remind yourself of that day when you're standing by, beside your beloved Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you're standing in front of these beautiful majestic gates and you walk in and you take that first step and the angels say, Peace be upon you for what you patiently endured in dunya. Welcome. And a caller will call out and say, you will live and never die. You will be healthy and never be sick. You will be young and never grow old. You will be eternally blissful and you will never, ever experience not even a second of misery ever again. Imagine your castle that's not made of bricks or steel. It's made of a bricks of gold and silver. Imagine your servants. Imagine that everything you want and more. Imagine the fact that you will just think of something and it will appear. You feel like cherries, oh, oop, right in front of you. You want some grilled chicken, there it goes. Remind yourself that you will be beautiful and your beauty will be comparable to the beauty of Yusuf السلام, who was so beautiful that when the women saw him, they cut their hands. 
And they said, there's no way this is a creature from this world. He must be an angel. Remind yourself of all the blessings. Remind yourself that just one dip in Jannah will make you forget all of the misery of this world. Remind yourself that Jannah is worth it. Remind yourself that 60, 70 years compared to forever is nothing. And I'll end with this. Imagine if Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk came to you and said to you, if you work for me and do exactly what I tell you to do for five years, I will give you all of my wealth. What would you do? You do it. Why? Because five years compared to the rest of your life is not a lot. Now, what is 60, 70, 80 years max compared to infinity? It actually is nothing, right? Anything compared to infinity is zero. Remind yourself of that. And every time shaitan makes you forget, tell him no. I'm working towards Jannah. I'm working towards the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people of Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this blessed night, in this blessed month, to grant us life to live and witness Ramadan. I ask him to make this Ramadan our best Ramadan yet and to allow us to witness and live and worship many Ramadans over and over. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to exchange our hardships for ease, to exchange our sorrows for happiness, to exchange anything that is causing us anxiety for tranquility and unshakable trust in Him. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same way that He gathered us here, that He gathers us all in Jannah for those of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam,